Live streaming is on. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Event trader Gavin McGuire here on this Thursday afternoon, July 20th. And we, of course, are being joined by chart trader Brett Manning for the latest edition of the Sentiment and Flow Show. Uh, hey, Brett, how Gavin, are how are today? you? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. How's life treating you? Pretty good. But I want to announce to everybody that um, we are going to be doing the show today under a Category 5 triplets warning. <laughs> So <laughs> at any moment, there could be three six-year-olds right here, and I'm doing the best I can. My wife is out of town, so it's just me and three six-year-olds here right now. Oh, the number so, of the devil, right, Brett? Three yeah, sixes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is what we're dealing with. So if you if suddenly hear a bunch of noises and then you hear me go, hey, guys, come on, you know, daddy's working. <laughs> you know, that could happen multiple times. Yes, yes. Well, they they usually pretty well behaved, right? So we'll 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 let them we'll let them have their moment in the sun and uh, get on and uh, do a little bit of talking if they get a chance. We could have so, a look at the data, maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Fresh, we, fresh perspective. Yeah, from the eye of a six-year-old, right? Yeah, they can see the <laughs> obvious thing that us cynical adults have lost the ability to notice. Very true. Very true. Well, one thing that we didn't lose, Brett, both of us uh, were on this pretty nicely. That was a short in the NASDAQ, um, which uh, it was funny. Obviously, we probably spent a little too much time together because we were both watching the same thing. Um, one of the things that had um, alerted uh, me to the uh, move was that spike in Apple which had mm -hmm. uh, taken place based around an AI headline. And it just, you know, I'd been kind of looking for a little bit of weakness and I'm sure you're of the same mindset where uh, things had really come pretty far, pretty fast going into earnings season, the first week and a half of earnings season, Brett. I know usually you don't trade too much during it because uh, there does tend to be some oddities as the, as the market starts to kind of hit a reset, right? And then we go into the next three month cycle until the following earnings. Pretty much. Yeah. Where there's just a lot of bottom up flows and it's just tough for me to know that what I'm seeing at the index level is really indicative of what it normally is. So I tend to hang back a little bit during the first couple of weeks. Right. But obviously we had both seen a setup that we were liking here. So again, for me, it was that spike around Apple where I was just looking for that headline blow off top. Um, mm -hmm. I've learned that through the years and following you, Brett. Uh, so obviously I've been doing a good job at listening to you because, uh, you know, we both jumped in on that and, um, you know, I had the 15,750 area as uh, as my planned level for where I'd be uh, taking final profits if I was able to get that move, and certainly mm -hmm. it did. So, uh, just kind of curious as to your thought process on what you were looking at going in, and uh, you know where you came up with uh, your target as sure. well. Well, so so the entry for me, I didn't see your entry. I was just watching that pattern because now that I look back and I see the timestamp of when you put the trade on. To me, you put the trade on at a time I never would because it was still a viable ascending triangle breakout at that point. Like you and and I, I wasn't aware of the Apple headline. I was just watching the pattern. And so I can totally understand your thought process there. But it, it you know, it formed an ascending triangle over about a little over 90 minutes um, with that, you know, sort of like 16,045 basically is sort of the trigger zone. Um you know, roughly 45 to 50 and and then it broke out above 50 and really kind of went sideways for maybe six or seven minutes while it was above that breakout trigger and that's when you put the short on and then of course it failed turned around and dumped uh for me the setup is you know you've got the sloped line coming up underneath that triangle if i see that breakout and and this is a really important part of it i see a lot of volume go off above that pattern a lot of volume happened above that trigger line, and then it moves back down to test or break under the sloped support line, the, the sort of upward trend line, after failing, after getting above the pattern trigger and then coming back down below it, and then it starts to hit that sloped line. So it's a failure at that point, especially if it's done a lot of volume. That's a lot of people buying that breakout. There's a lot of stops about to be hit. So mine was a little later and a little lower than Gavin's, and my target was... So my target was if you if you you see it was sort of in the same area you're looking, but if you got a spike down on the 18th off the morning, the low of that I wanted to see flush under, 
and that was uh, 15, 7, 30. So I wanted to see the stops run below that spike. Basically, there's a two-day pattern rally. You know, the midway through the second day, the market starts to roll over. I wanted to take out the bottom of that first day of that rally. Yeah, I see it right there, right on the 18th. That, of course, yeah, so, was the lows. So the 25 area to me, you know, 15, 7, 25, that basically to hit. All right. Well, it's def definitely nice that we are just kind of watching things here. We are near the lows around that 15,700 level as the selling continues. And we'll get into a little bit of positioning and the sentiment data here in a second. But before we do that, Brett, um, I'd kind of doubled up on things here and uh, went after the S&P. Uh, got in a nice entry there around 45.91. Uh, did come up with that bounce to 45.90.75. So sometimes sometimes you get lucky, right? Sometimes you get ticked out. Where was uh, you stopped there? 45.91. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's it's like right. Sometimes you get this. Sometimes you have the other story. Yeah, yeah. I, I always remember the time. I think it was around 2018 or whatever. Whenever the Christmas Eve uh, massacre was, I remember getting ticked out by one point on that on a trade while I was on a while I was on a flight, and that really upset uh, me. <laughs> but um, so I'd, so I'd be curious. But so I've already banked half of it. This was more of an intraday trade. Obviously, the Nasdaq was a little bit of a lower hanging fruit um, for just the pure run up and valuation standpoint, and uh, you know with a lot of earnings coming up um we had seen pretty steady bids going into the banks following relatively pedestrian earnings so s&p certainly not as soft as it but i already had the nasdaq uh short on so i figured i'd go after the s&p got it at 45.91 we banked some pro nice profits there i got my stop there so i'd be curious as to so my thinking is that i think we could see uh this dive down further so i'm not quick to um cover it right now i've already got profits in the bank and i've got my stop at entry so i got zero risk i get a free look at a breakdown i'd be curious as to how you'd be treat, uh, treating this trade i mean look yeah your free look is i i in my my process is the same I, I would i would let it run it's one of these statistical set decisions you know and if you've done a lot of um if you've done a lot of of like my experience programming trading systems and then looking at mass data results when you go you know back testing a system over the course of two years of data and it spits out every single trade you know you get that really good sort of uh, instant gratification feeling when you can see how here's how it did over an entire year and you see every single trade and 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 you know those samples are made up of a lot of situations where the decision to let this run isn't the right one but the small number of situations where it is the right one more than makes up for that and and it's tough to get that kind of instinctively through your head because you don't want to give up those profits that you already have. But once you've already got something, it's already been a successful trade. You're positioned in a situation where you're kind of looking for. I mean, I'm 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 trying not trying to put words in your head, but I'm guessing you were kind of looking for a little bit more of a corrective swing in the market, given some of the sentiment data that we're going to talk about, as well as you know some of the really big uh, earnings prints we're going to see next week, and maybe people hedging a bit in front of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you've got that 4,500 test possibility. Yeah. And, and uh, that would be an area that I would certainly have on my radar here. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll let this play out. And, and I don't think either one of us are, and we'll discuss this in a little bit deeper, um, are really all that bearish right now. But there does set up for a little bit of correction given some of the price action that we've seen. Sure. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing, you know, a lot and, and of new all-time highs, breaks, and stuff. So we, yeah. two weeks, two, a month ago, what was our mantra? Our mantra was, well, it's a bull market now. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, like, regardless of what people are saying, this is a bull market. And, you know, we even and at that time, that was a novel idea. And when we said it in April, that was a novel idea. You know, but that's what the data is suggesting based on our perspective. And now you're starting to see the sorts of things that are going to confirm it for a lot of people, like the industrials making all-time highs today. Um, you know, there's a lot of pointers here that this is not just a, a weird bubble of a handful of mega cap stocks ramping on some, you know, AI excitement. Right, right. And let's break into some of that. Um, starting off, Brett, with some of the market characteristics. Uh, you know, one of the key tailwinds I'm finding out there is soft landing expectations, certainly on 
are, are growing. Uh, you know, that hard landing feels like it's been taken off the table, at least in terms of a sediment perspective, of course. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of data that needs to come in. And when these earnings should be of interest as well. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we have seen is fewer S&P 500 companies have been mentioning recession on calls. This is the third straight quarter that that's declined. Um, Say that again? For the third straight quarter, comments about expecting recessions on conference calls have declined. Just, so, uh, just as interesting. so trending view. down three quarters yeah. in a row, even so though if you were to look at Google Trends and see recession, the mention of recession, I, I guess maybe people after 18 months got tired of calling for a recession, right? Yeah, so, I've heard so, it called the, the, the most with the the most anticipated non recession ever or something it really is right and and uh, part of that of course has to do with the group think and social media and just the passage of that which we've discussed and the sentiment data the social mood the kind of right. everything that made up that you know all the data we've been talking about for the last year yeah the bubble yeah. in the bubble in risk aversion as the i call bubble it in risk, the risk bubble aversion, risk aversion bubble. Bubble. i really like was i like it really was um, Fed is expected to raise 25 basis points next week. We'll get a little bit deeper into there. And uh, the peak right now is projected at 5.33%, meaning that th the July rate hike is expected to be the last one. And we'll talk about that in deeper. Uh, China, um, China's weak stimulus is expected. Uh, you know, one of the other data points that kind of aids into the shorts that we had here was China leaving its loan prime rate for the one and five year unchanged. I think that was a disappointment for the markets uh, and expectations, which we'll also talk about later on, of uh, China exporting disinflation to the rest of the world, too. Um, consumers, they remain steady according to, to the bank reports and the data that we've seen. Uh, we got some slides coming up on that. Commodities trade all the, the most of the commodities, Brett, are trading above the 50 day moving averages. But, uh, you know, China stimulus has helped provide it. Ukraine uncertainty, you know, with wheat and oil and that gas has also helped. Yet investors remain underweight, another topic that we will be addressing. Yeah. And then one that's kind of just uh, crept on is the weak dollar. Now, we'll get into each one of these slides, Brett, but uh, any thoughts on the broader market characteristics and uh, anything that might not be mentioned here? Well, I think it's like, you know, there's a little bit of sort of the definition of insanity going on on Wall Street a little bit. Um, like you see the, just like you said, the, the, you know, the, the calls for recession are declining in a steady trend. And we've kind of breaking past that barrier of saying, you know, we're teetering on the verge of recession. And, you know, it's just so hard for, for that, you know, sort of asset allocation crowd to kind of break out of that, even though they're saying, they see the soft landing now as the most likely outcome. There's still, you know, the, but growth is going to slow way down and we can't put any money in commodities. And, and yet, you know, I mean, you can see the trends happening. I mean, you can see the, the, you know, oil finally just completely held off that support, fended off everything at 65. And, you know, now it's knocking on the door of maybe 80. Like we've got these sorts of shifts that are happening and shifts in the psychology around, the economic picture and you know the soft landing situation and suddenly the fed's not hiking anymore growth is holding up and yet they're still not pulling the trigger and and it's just like we watched with equities this was the story with equities in february and march you know same thing and eventually you know it took till june but then they started pulling the trigger reluctantly buying everything in sight and it's it's kind of you know we may see the same thing the same story for commodities as we get a little further into the back half of the year and you just have to give up on the idea that you're looking for a Q4, Q1 shift into recession. And, and then, you know, these things are so under positioned, they're so under allocated to that. Yeah. You may see the chase in commodities like we saw in equities in, in late May and through June. Okay. So let's break into this a little, some of these uh, thoughts a little deeper, starting off as per usual with the AAI ID data, Brett, and I'm just going to go through these three slides real quick, and then uh, we'll circle back and get your thoughts. Um, but obviously, things have been heating up here. We at 
0.4% on the bullish side, down to 21.5% on the bearish side. Neutral also fell. So, um, you know, everybody went from either neutral or bearish to uh, bullish. This was the seventh straight week of running over 40%. Um, the 51.4% was a 52-week high for the data. And uh, as we can see here, and the 21.5% 52-week low for the bulls. In fact, that was the highest bull reading since April of uh, 2021. And the uh, bull bear spread at 30 was also the highest level since April 2021. And uh, just taking a look at the eight-week moving average, that's the highest since April of 2022. And Brett, um, you know, one of the things that I had pointed out before, I don't know if you saw that comment, but um, I had put up a comment just talking about the last time we had seen some of the characteristics in the AAII. And uh, hold on a sec pulling that up right now and i'll just read that off to you and then we'll get your thoughts okay. but um obviously so you'd have to go back to april 2021 the last time we were kind of seeing data like this and some of the market characteristics back then um you know we're in the midst of recovering with the hopes of vaccines of course you know we just come out biden had won the election pfizer came out in november with the uh, vaccine that had started off that little bull market um, or really had kind of um, accentuated the bull market run that had really started uh, in the basically at the depths of that March to 2020 decline. The S&P had uh, already rallied 60% off the COVID lows in April 2021 when we were seeing this uh, optimism. Markets would continue that upward trend as uh, we pushed another 14% into the November all-time highs before rolling over. 10-year at that time was at 1.63%. That's in April 2021. It would not rise above that until April, January 2022. And can you so, tell me what was leading the top 40 charts? What, <laughs> <laughs> it was just a I, don't, good, I don't know. You're doing a good gonna, job of giving me that feeling of context. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess Taylor Swift was. Taylor but, Swift was <laughs> riding high, <at> number one. <laughs> <laughs> so case of case, I'm coming in here. Yeah, um, so we had a run of four out of five weeks in April 2021 of 50% plus yep bullish sentiment um before that you'd have to go around december 2017 through january of 2018 the last time we saw a run similar to that in terms of the bullish sentiment at that point rates were in the midst of a rally as the trump tax plan raised expectations for the fed to move uh the 10-year at that juncture in january 2022 was at 2.72 percent there's some plea as a peak close January at 2022 at 2800 and then we proceed to chop around between 2500 to 2900 for the next nine months as uncertainty around the trade war picked up so Brett right. with that backdrop on the AAII what are your some of thought what are some of your thoughts on this data how does it differentiate as well the timing of the market right now from 2021 and 2018 Sure. So first of all, I gave you this the, the news yesterday for anybody who was reading the ETF daily notes. I actually, you know, went ahead and told you yesterday that this week's AAII bull was going to be 50 plus. So I'm now calling AAII numbers, apparently. But um all uh, in it well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it, it, this huge difference between um now and January 2018 or you know, December 2017 to January 2018. That's really that's an instance in which having a big jump in the AAII bullish percentage led to a period of topping in the market. And historically, it's not such a good contrarian indicator on this side. It's a better contrarian indicator the other way. So if you look at April 2021, uh, we got that, you know, that sustained period above 50 highest in years. And then the market rallied for another eight straight months. Like it wasn't anything like a top. And in fact, just actually just a couple months earlier in, in November 2020, we got a spike up to 55.8. And still, you know, that was just in the middle of a steady uptrend. So it doesn't have to be a topping signal. The difference with uh, January 2018. So this was a, a, a massive institutionally driven bull market 2017 was just a parabolic rally and it was institutional money 
And it was all running in front of that tax cut deal. Right. I mean, I remember Robert Reed wrote a piece about how just they're good. They're, they're basically just printing earnings for people with that deal. Like it was just it was just a gigantic, gigantic gift of profitability for companies almost directly. And and and, you know, the market just launched into it. And right after the deal signed, we started January 2018 and just a parabolic rush as retail investors finally just said, well, I have to be a part of this. You know, and it went just in this parabolic rip up and you see the AAII bullish percentage had been just middling for the entire rally until that shift. And it was basically money flows. Like, what are you going to do to allocate your money for 2018 for the year? And every analyst on Wall Street is saying the market's going to the moon, you know, and so they're reacting to what's already really a crowded institutional trade. And and, you know, this is what Wall Street does, right? They, they want to do this. This is the model. Um, you know, get in front and then have somebody to sell to. And, and you know, it worked out just that way in 2018. Right now is a very different situation. Um, retail's been out in front. And we've seen it really for the last six weeks or so. And it showed up in a steady climb in this data. Um, but you've seen it in, you know, just seeing this allocation situation that we're going to talk about in the fund manager survey where there's not kind of still you know, leaning a little bit like, you know, they don't want to chase and they're not really, not really loving this. Um, and, and so I think there's a different dynamic there. And I, and I wouldn't see this as your best kind of contrarian topping signal. I'd want to see a lot of other signals with that, like a big, a big drop in the robo ratio. Um, just that, you know, hedging just disappearing. We've seen some drop in hedging data, but, you know, if we really saw just hedging just go off a cliff, we just people just basically throwing in like, you know, well, can't fight it. So we're going to join it. Um, and you see maybe a little bit more erratic price action in some of the more speculative plays. Maybe we're starting to see that a little bit, but I want to see a lot more of it to look at like a real contrarian bearish call in the market. But this is this is a big evolution toward that direction. It just you know, there's a lot of history that suggests it's not the best indicator to make that kind of call. Yeah, right. In that 2021 um, time frame where we still had another 14 percent to go. That's one of mm -hmm. the reasons why I wanted to highlight that it doesn't necessarily mean and even the 2018 period. Right. I mean, that was more of a chop. Right. Than um, than anything else. Yeah. So. But there were there were some moves. I mean, that we got if you if you zoom in a little bit, the initial the initial pullback was, you know, there was some sharp movement. Um, I remember right. That. But that also, there. also, if you recall, that was right when the trade war started, right? Yeah. That just unleashed a whole slew of uncertainty. So okay, um, hold on. Yeah. I've got my, my first triplet issue. Right here. So just hold on. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. We're going to be moving on to the next slide here. Brett will be joining us back in a second, but we're going to talk about some of the key characteristics going on right now in the bank of america fund manager survey which would this would have been released just last um two days ago actually uh sentiment overall remains bearish uh their words not mine um you, you know then there's definitely some items that kind of point towards that right so 60 percent of investors expected All right, global back. growth I'm just going through the uh, Bank of America Fund Manager Survey's item of interest slide here, Brett. Hey, um, can you close the door, please? Close the door. No, no, it, sweetie. Uh, it was the sorry. biggest underweight in commodities since May 2020. Uh, cash levels, they rose to 5.3% from 5.1%, so a little bearish there. Soft land in expectations, that's up to 68%. We, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that slide going forward. Uh, EPS expectations, least pessimistic since February 2022. Uh, the biggest tail risk remains inflation and policy mistakes. Uh, allocations to stocks, they were at seven-month highs here. Um, it was the first underweight in the Eurozone year to date as some weaker data from Germany has been leading people out from there. And then we had the biggest overweight in industrial since February of 2022. So, Brett, we're going to be getting into each one of these a little bit deeper. But um, what's your overall general thoughts on the B of A, uh, some of the items of interest here? I expected it to be more um, joining, you know. Joining the sense of a, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, sweetie, you gotta let daddy work. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry. 
Um, so I expected it to be a little bit more kind of like, okay, we're just going to throw in now because, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. Um, it more dramatically, and it's still kind of holding out a little bit more and kind of gradually releasing in that direction without just jumping in whole hog. Um, you know, I don't know entirely what to make of it. I, I'm really looking for when when is the point we see, you know, uh, um, like Kalanovich and Wilson just finally give up. Yeah, you know I mean? like when, I, when I, is I, that? I, I I feel like that capitulation is never going to quite come. You and, think and they can't just, do it? Yeah, they'll, they'll just wait in three years down the road. They'll be so right. See. They'll be like, I told you. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going to take for them to capitulate. I continue to see some of the talking heads coming on CNBC, and you know, they'd just rather you know wait for that broken clock to hit two o'clock again. You know, <laughs> rather rather than rather than admit that they were wrong i guess yeah so, so yeah i mean it, i, I it's, it's definitely moving like the the fund manager perspective on this market has come a long way it just hasn't come as far as i would have thought at this point given the breadth build out really you know like it was easy to hold on to this idea that it's just chat gpt and then you know, what that's going to do for NVIDIA and then a few choice picks and how Microsoft and Google are going to see, you know, and, 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 but, but it's really just, you know, localized. And that was, that was, we had a couple weeks of that reality, you know, over the last few months where it really was just a handful of gigantic mega cap technology stocks, you know, that were, you know, heading into a period to possibly revolutionary profitability based on a specific new technology. But now, you know, I mean, like the banks are out of the doghouse. The industrials are at new all-time highs. The transports are ripping. Energies are, you know, being, a, you know, taken part. And it just built out into the whole thing at this point. Like, I don't know how you could look at this market if you have any yeah. any degree of experience. If you've been doing this for 10 or 20 years or 30 years, like how, how do you look at this market and not see what is in front of you? Yeah, I mean, one one of the more annoying things I hear is from a lot of these people is when the, all, they're asked about it, they're like, "Oh, well, we've been invested in it." <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at some of those uh, pieces that you're just talking about. First year to date returns here. Um, this would have been from the uh, last Friday, so the five day and one day are a little off. Year to date, just a little off too. But you get the you get a fair idea. Obviously, Nasdaq been the big winner here. Uh, up over 40%. Um, the Russell 1000 growth names as well, pretty great, pretty solid performance there, up about 32%. Uh, then then you come down to the S&P, that, that's up about 17% for the year here. Uh, the Russell 2K growth, also a strong performer. And then you start seeing some of the laggards coming in here. Uh, the Russell in general, which I know, Brett, you had a great call on that. I think you're still involved in the IWM. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's really bad. You know, the last two weeks, it's it's had a number of days where it was clearly leading the market. So it's there's a shift. Things are, you know, filtering down to that level at this point. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, you, you know, and that's what we're about to discuss here. But you can see the laggards have certainly been value um, the small caps and everything. So that's part of the conversation that we're talking about. Now, real quick, before we dive into that, just taking keeping an eye out on valuations here. This is where things start to get a little bit questionable. Uh, just looking at the S&P from the FY24 estimates. This is even FY23, but it's right around that 240 area. And this is a slide that would be helpful to have. It's from JP Morgan, just kind of highlighting um, you know, where the S&P consensus goes and where um, that ranks in terms of valuation here. That's and you can, right? Yeah, and you, you can see certainly getting um, pretty high on the valuation. Now, there's certainly the argument that the, the market has earned a, a new um, valuation standpoint. That's been a common argument from the people who are always worrying about it. And I don't think you could use valuation as a firm area brett i know you being a tech <laughs> trader and a momentum trader you I, I remember scott used to just laugh anytime i talked about valuation and he would just simply say the valuation is what the valuation is <laughs> so uh, but from a standpoint well, i mean of it's like, sort of like to me it's like this it's an elastic band it is yes. it's an elastic band but that means it's worthless really because 
you know, like it's never going to give you a signal in particular, you know, it's never going to give you hard signal because right. it's always got enough elasticity to, you know, operate inside of the boundary of other signals that will probably be stronger and more high conviction whenever. It could give you shading, you know, shading on maybe it's it maybe it's kind of like it's kind of like uh in meteorology it's kind of like air pressure zones you don't know it's going to rain or there's going to be a thunderstorm but we do see high pressure moving in or whatever you know or a low pressure zone is coming into the area so it's possible we'll start to see other signs that are more deterministic about you know we're going to have a storm but so it, it sets a condition where you know people will maybe have an easier time letting go of positions if we get really you know into well outside of a standard zone of acceptable valuations from you know from the sort of normie fundamental crowd and you know then you start to see other things happen that kind of show there's some 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 issues in other ways in the market then you realize there's going to be a crowd of people who do look at valuations that are going to be they're going to have an easier time getting rid of them right and where I- we are I, I, I do think it also helps too in terms of um, profit taken, for instance. Well, it's a similar people, idea, we're, we're, sure. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 it's easier people, to let it go. It's easier to let it go, exactly. Even and, if you're and, really and, wrong and, to do it. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the 20 level, just from a psychological standpoint, certainly factors in, I would say, in terms of immediate trading, where you might yeah. have more people willing to short or, or things along those lines. So, But that's the valuation there. Uh, returning a year to date returns. This is going by sectors. You can see communication services is dominated. Um, tech as well, up tech 45% communication services, which includes um, you know Netflix and everything. That's been a strong performer. Consumer discretionary, Tesla, of course, the primary driver going on there. Um, but then once you take those three out of the way, the rest of the market hasn't had a great time. And we're going to talk about that here momentarily. Uh, you can see energy's certainly been a big lagger, down 7%. Healthcare as well, the defensive sector, down 3%. Utilities, you know, no one's wanted. I mean, what, what's the point of owning a, new, a utility if um, T-bills are, are yeah. giving you 4% on a three-month, you know? Um, so, uh Nothing too surprising here, but I thought the slide just did a good job at kind of throwing everything in front of people. Um, but that's kind of one of the things that we're looking at here, Brett, right? Um, so then, of course, there's the year-to-date returns of the Magnificent Seven, which has certainly been one of the key drivers going in. I mean, look at Meta Platforms and Tesla there, up both up in triple digits. The worst performer has been Google, and that's 41% year-to-date. So it just kind of really highlights um how strong that group's been but that's to the point brett right where we're all of a sudden starting to see that breath expanding especially uh given the performance over the last few days where you've seen financials and energy really taking place and industrials at 52 week highs here and and you can see 74 percent of the s p 500 are trading above that 200 day moving average now it's not nearly it is the extremes is what we've seen in the past. So um, all those slides taken into consideration, Brett, what's your thought process? Well, for one thing, so I had to get a little conceptual at time with these things. So when you look at the, um, when you look at the Magnificent Seven and you look at some of like, just to kind of go in a different tangent from what I was saying earlier, when you look at what's really happening in terms of developments in artificial intelligence, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really stunning the kind of pace that things are moving at at this point. Yeah. A- uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alex, you, okay, go ahead. All right, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Close my door. All right. So in right. terms of the implications for like, like you look at the, you know, there's seven companies and we've got this whole stock market. And then you start to think in terms of, well, what's their share of the real economy in a decade? You know what I mean? Like Probably if this is where easy. you get ground zero of operationalizing models that are, are just like a huge expansion from something like chat GPT four, like where we get, where we're really starting to move into sort of the zone where people really don't know whether or not we've got a sort of AGI situation. Um, and you know, what's their share? What's this, if, 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 if it's contained in these seven companies, that kind of 
level of technology that's basically just then you know uh, uh, licensed out in some form or another to every company in the world and is doing all of the work you know the share is astronomical at that point so i i think that there's a little bit of and, and you know i've said for the last several months i've said the only analog i see for the period that we've seen over the last year is 1994 you recall that right yeah with what when the internet was just starting to get and we had the soft landing battle with the fed and we had all-time record short index futures and we had everybody calling for a recession that never came and we had the inklings of a truly world changing kind of technology revolution that sort of have burbling under the surface like all those things were in play then all those things have been in play now like those are both very very similar kinds of scenarios it's the only it's the only situation that looks to me and feels to me analogous and and i mean it is the case that in the next 10 years the world is going to become completely unrecognizable to us now in terms of just the basic way that people live their lives the basic way the economy functions the basic way we do research everything and we have no idea how far that's going to take us or how fast how many problems are going to be solved really far quicker than we ever imagined and who knows maybe negative consequences but I think that you've got to look at some of what we're seeing right now in terms of cash flows into the market is, is people you know, on the 401k side just knowing whatever it is, they don't know if they're going to lose their job or not, but the only way to know that they're going to be a part of what's happening is to own shares in these companies. Yeah, it's cer certainly been um, pretty evident in where we've seen money allocated to. Uh, so, you know, the theme that will continue to be watched. And I think you had brought it up, Brett, a couple of months ago that people aren't going to want to let these go. So anytime these things see it dip, un unless we get some sort of regulatory action, breaking them That's up or the whatever. Thing. It's always the thing with them. Do we, because that could change absolutely everything, right? I mean, if yeah. this, you know, government seizes effective control over these technologies and it becomes a universal basic income economy and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or is this, you know, at the point where they acquire every single blade of grass that's just poked above the soil line, you know, does the, is this a federal trade commission situation? Yeah. So um, stock allocation, Brett, at this juncture here, uh, we can see stock allocation still remains low for the most part. It is starting to rebound a little bit. Um, and, you know, you can see down here in this chart that I have up the net percentage of Bank of America fund manager surveys that are overweight global equities still remains low. So uh, still money on the sidelines, as we were talking about before, that, you know, that bullish sentiment, you need other metrics to kind of match up. Yeah. And this too. is why it's so different from 2018 January. You'd see these lines in the opposite place, right? Yeah. I mean, not exactly. that much, but you see that sense of of the 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 the. The fund flow money was basically jumping well ahead of the retail money. Yeah. And now it's pretty much the inverse situation. All right. Crowded trades. No surprise. Long big tech. Long Japan equities. Short China. Um, long T-bills. Short U.S. dollars. Short U.S. banks. Uh, now, I know, Brett, you don't always love this um this particular chart but uh it does give a sense of where people think that the money is at least anyway so that short u.s banks certainly uh, is another thing that could give us a leg higher here you, you, you recall everybody was short tech coming into 2023 didn't work out well for them right uh so now just watching the banks it'll be interesting to see if they can kind of mimic what the uh, tech sector did yeah right so um yeah, i hadn't fully appreciated this chart here um yeah again it kind of falls prey to the this sort of well we've talked about it enough times before but you know you get the idea whatever is obviously who's going to answer what the crowded trade is if that's what they're crowded into but right. that runs against some of what we hear about positioning anecdotally yeah so i mean it's a it's a difficult read to make meaning of this all right. Underweight commodities. This is one of the more interesting aspects. And I know, Brett, this was one of the reasons why you took that USO trade. Um, you, you know, just lowest 
Bit investors' most underweight commodities since May 2020. And again, it's interesting because when you look at the futures for a lot of these charts, copper, oil, and all that, they're all trading over their 50s now, um, which technically would be strong, but still haven't been able to get people off the sidelines to get in there. So do you still like this commodity trade? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's for partly for this reason that you, you see kind of a shift in, in presumptions about the economic track forward and you haven't really seen the shift in positioning and, you know, it, 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 it certainly makes sense to me and I've got other reasons to like oil, but the basic, yeah, I mean, that certainly is like a tailwind, especially when you've got such a weak dollar. Yeah. All right. Let's let's uh, circle to the Fed here, Brett. We got um, obviously they will be meeting next Wednesday. Speaking of the week, ex- dollar. Ex- yeah, right. Expectations are pretty firmly in place for a twenty-five basis point move. And I want to talk to you about the dollar here in a second, but um, you can see Fed rate cuts expected in the first half of twenty twenty-four. Uh, you, you know, I don't I don't really worry too much about that. Um, you know, keeping an eye out on some of the different areas here. You can see core services, X housing, the quote unquote sticky data that is starting to come down. We're seeing signs of that uh, Fed balance sheet outside of that one blip around the um, the uh, Silicon Valley banking crisis. That's starting to come back down as they continue to yeah. drain liquidity out from the swamp. Uh, Fed lending, you can see. That's cooled off a little bit. That red line, that's from the special facility that they put into place, the bank term funding program Mm -hmm. uh, right around Silicon Valley. Um, You know, that continues to see a pretty big uptake, but we are seeing it flatline a little bit. So uh, hopefully that means that credit conditions are starting to get a little bit uh, more, a little quieter. And then you got here rates, expectations first, inflation expectations. So Brett, taking a look collectively at the Fed, I think we're both in agreement that they'll go 25 basis points. Um, where I'm kind of a little bit more interested in your thoughts is uh, right now the market's pricing in a year-end rate of 5.33%, which uh, suggests only one more rate hike. We've certainly heard Pal and a, a number of others talk about two more rate hikes probably being ideal. The market isn't really buying that. Some of the disinflationary numbers, certainly last week with all Mm -hmm. the weaker inflation data weighs in on that. Um, What's your thought on next Wednesday? What are you expecting to see from Powell and company in his press release or or in his press conference, I should say? You know, I kind of wonder, I mean, first off, the the idea that this is the last Fed rate cut is what the whole world believes, or the last rate hike for the cycle. Like there, there was a Reuters poll just a few days ago, I think it was um, uh, something like um, 85 out of 106 uh, uh, economists polled about it, said that they strongly believe this would be the last hike of the cycle. So whatever it is, the market is assuming that. So whatever happens. So there's a possibility. There's another dynamic going on, which is financial conditions easing, right, with rates failing that breakout, coming back down with equities and the wealth effect kind of moving. You've got rate cuts, effectively rate cuts that have been happening for the last month and a half, just in terms of how people feel about their financial situation. That leads to more spending, right? When you when you, when you see this kind of bull market energy and people's portfolios are people's retirement accounts are swelling and interest rates are inflecting back to the downside. There's a, that, that's a, that's like the rate. That's like the fed cutting right there. So that's inflationary. And I, and I, and I feel like it's just possible that, you know, Powell is sitting there kind of thinking he doesn't want to hike anymore. Um, but it, it, he may want to kind of signal that the situation is more precarious than that. You know, at that point, even if they don't plan on hiking any further this year, even even if we do end up right where right where the Fed funds futures say we'll end up in December, you know, the language might be a little harsher because yeah. you people are just getting away with murder in the markets to them. And and, you know, you, you look at these economist surveys that even though the Fed has said we need to hike more, all the economists are out there saying they don't mean it. You know, we're not yeah. buying it. <laughs> So he may so, he may so, kind of try to laugh so, back at that. So should we call this the Fed short put? Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, I could see, I could see, but you know, I could see, I could see 
boy cried wolf situation here because they keep on saying it and the market's just not believing it. So, yeah. you know, it, it, can... it's it's reminiscent to me of when they were going on with the uh, transition, the inflation being transitory. You, oh, you know, oh. where, where where they keep where you get the feeling that they're just talking their book, right? Well, maybe not their book, but um, that they're trying to win the narrative rather than allow the narrative <laughs> to win the play narrative. out. Yeah. yeah, because sort of similar, except then they thought they were right. And now they just want people to, to believe their bluff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they want they, they it's important to them to use the communications channel to keep financial conditions from cutting too much. And so they're they you know that's not a, that's not a hike situation for them in September, but it's a bluff situation. Right. Keep everybody in check, like Greenspan used to say. You know that you that you you gotta you gotta show them the bazooka or whatever, you know to to like just let them know you know you got it, and they could use it at any time and make sure that they know you're you're planning to or you might be who knows, and just kind of keep everybody you know hinged in tethered in. Um, it, but it just, you know, markets have a way of just kind of doing a real good job of ferreting that out when it's not for real. And, and it just seems like that's where the market's at right now that, that, you know, and, 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 and sort of the economists too, like just, this is going to be the last hike no matter what he says. So we'll see what he does to try to introduce a sense of uncertainty about that. Yeah. Should be interesting. We'll have more on that, of course, next week. Um, so keeping an eye out on some of the other pieces here, Citigroup Economic Surprise Index. It's been running pretty steady. You can see it's been an uptick over the last couple of weeks here, as especially on the inflation front. Sentiment data remains weak, but the hard data has been um, generally outperforming expectations. Except for the last short period. Yeah. Where you've got, you've got the... Um... Uh, the hard versus soft data shift in the other direction a little bit. And I think the Michigan thing was probably part of that. Like, there was such a massive jump. Right, in, right. In well, two, well I'm, I'm looking, if you look at Empire and Philly Fed, they were both a little lighter this week, right? So, um, it, 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 it's to your point, though. What what what, what did you call it? Um, the, um, not not the, the bubble, of the pessimism bubble or whatever? Oh, yeah. You know, so there, there's two ways to interpret that, right? Are people misplaced in their optimism? You know, or were they just so misplaced in their pessimism? Yeah. Well, one thing that them the bubble and risk aversion. Yeah, that was my. Yeah. The um, the um the um yeah exactly that's a, that's a, that's a great one. That would be a good name of a book. Um, but um, so just taking a look, soft landing. This is the one sentiment data point that is working in the favor of um the bulls here. Uh, you know, well potentially at least we'll see if it comes to fruition but soft landing still the general expection expected area at this time um now we're going to turn to some of the credit concerns out there right obviously commercial real estate still at the top now yeah we had sl green out and uh they had decent results. they're making it up they're just making it up <laughs> oh, that's um, just, how did he not yeah yeah, I mean, uh, Blackstone as well, too. We're not, uh, oh, were they? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, they're all hanging in right now. Everybody knows that they're weak, but we haven't hit that inflection point of worrying about people making debt payments yet. It's just um, like the, the opposite of the AI thing, right? I mean, it's yeah. like a secular shift is happening here, and maybe you can kind of surprise me here and there, but I know what I'm not doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, but I'm I, not I, selling my... Google or whatever, or Microsoft for Bernardo. Right. To, to, yeah, exactly. And for my long term <laughs> hold. Right? That has been a little bit of a squeeze. The shorts have just kind of gotten broad based, smacked across the board there, I yeah. think. So hybrid um, and virtual offices and AI workers. Yeah. Uh, we got the US shadow banking, uh, China real estate, US corporate debt, US uh, um, European sovereign debt. None of them have really, um, you know, hit a red flag yet, but that's where people are looking, of course. Uh, keeping an eye on the consumer, that was going to be a big item this week. And you can see, you know, or, or for earnings season, and the banks haven't really reflected. There's certainly been a little bit of an uptick in net charge offs and everything, but that's off historic lows to, We'll see if when people have to start paying their um, 
their uh, student debt loans if that kind of squeaks things a little bit more that's going to be an element of the back half of the year that people are going to be watching but just keep it an eye out on uh, it, i thought this is a good chart from jp morgan where they show consumer spending that's been reined in a little bit people are well aware watching their p's and q's uh consumer credit that has also pulled in as people aren't spending as much on the credit cards and everything uh savings rates that you know you could see that big dip down where once we got the reopening everyone was just spending that savings rate that's starting to ease a little bit and then hourly earnings which does help offset some of the other issues that they have there that's kind of coming into play so you know the consumer credit uh, you know here's the net charge offs that's what i was talking about coming off those historic lows really just coming into where we were in 2016 through 2020 which was perfectly fine uh, you can see that big spike off, Brett, during 2008, the uh, great financial crisis. And yeah. that's what a financial crisis looks like. <laughs> that's so, your baby right there. But, but I mean, point being on this slide is credit is not a major concern right now and shouldn't be a headwind. Do you got any thoughts on this particular well, I mean, topic? So as I understand the narrative, the sort of steady hand, gauge of the economy that the guys who've been the guys and gals who've been right over the course of this period where it's been the most common recession call ever that never materialized people who have been on the other side of that call and who've looked for the sort of just st steady growth situation that's going to be able to manage to get through this period um even if we have regional banks having issues even if we have the fed hiking more than you thought um, their argument has generally been, you know, that there is a pool of household uh, solvency reserve, an ammunition pile that that comes off of, you know, a lot of the, the, the fiscal expansion during the pandemic. And and that just we we're, we we've we've eaten into that mountain of ammunition, but we haven't we haven't at all exhausted it. And so there's just this reserve of money that households have. And that, you know, that just kind of, it, it, it makes it awfully tough to see things really just, you know, turn and go into a real dark place economically, even against any hurdles. And it's just kind of continued to be, I mean, eventually we're going to get to the point where people are spending it's all credit, you know, and, and we really don't have, that reserve anymore and you know the savings rate is nothing and the turtles have their necks sticking out into you know into broad daylight and and then you know we hit an inflection point and nobody we don't have that foundation of support where you can weather you know shifts when you get a shift when everybody's got their necks sticking out you know guess what it's goodbye and and it's just we haven't had that situation we've had a, a stockpile to, to work off. And we've had people, you know, being very cautious in terms of how they're managing their households, businesses everywhere. And it's tough until you start to blow that off and you just get everybody with the party hat on, you know, it's tough for a turn to, to, I guess, you know, get some feedback going and get some dominoes. All right. Then uh, just turn into earnings here. Um, interesting. We are seeing some of the negative impacts from disinflation on display here. Uh, Electrolics, which is an appliance uh, company over in Europe, they had a terrible quarter. It's one of the reasons why I got into the Whirlpool short today. By the way, we are starting to slip down below 45.75 there. In You're the not talking about Electrolux, are you? Yeah. What did right. I say? Electrolics. Which is <laughs> the electrolux. Well, it's just cooler sounding. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh Netflix, um, you know, they had some issues on the disinflationary front and Ford, the EV plays, you know, cutting their prices there. So we are starting to see some signs of that. And that's the impact it's gonna have on earth. There is gonna be a negative dimension to this disinflation on earnings for the companies that don't have the pricing power there. Um Sure. Looking at the bank's provisions, slightly higher than expected. I just think that that's just prudent conservatism on the bank's part. We've seen this time and time again. 
Um, people buying regionals despite underwhelming earnings also on the bank in front there. Uh, revenue shortfalls in tech have been relatively common at this juncture, showing a slowdown in some of the um, demand that's out there. And again, some disinflationary forces on that front. Uh, margin improvement continues. Just U.S. corporate efficiency, probably the most underrated story over the last 20 years, Brett. Uh, guidance that remains conservative and prudently so, I would say, given the macroeconomic uncertainty. Uh, chips not out of the macroeconomic malaise yet, as evident by the Taiwan semi commentary. And that was one of the key things that they needed to get through and why you're seeing a bit of a pullback there. And then as we we're just talking about credit not being an issue. Uh, you got any thoughts on any one of those themes there, Brett? No, not really. I mean, um, kind of it's at this point we're to the section where basically what we're saying is going to be redundant with things that we've said conceptually. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the final slide that we're going to be looking at is pessimism around China that continues. Um, you got any uh, thoughts on China itself in terms of the idea that they could be um, uh, exporting their dif- disinflation to the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, it's a thing, but in an inflationary world, it's not so bad. It was a lot worse when they did it in, what, 2015, 2016. Yeah. Um, That was crashy. You know, I don't know if we get crashy at, you know, core inflation at 5 or 6%. So we could use a little of that, you know, deflation over here. Yeah. Um, well, well the, one thing that I do think it factors into, Brett, is uh, number one, largest trade partner, Europe, obviously, right? Yep. Um, you, so, you know, it, they've got a lot, lot of trade with Japan and they've yep. got a lot. And then you got the UK just kind of on the peripheral there. So when you see the euro, 56% of the Dixie, um, sterling, 14% in yen, uh, 12 percent i might have the yen and sterling mixed up there um but two things that that factors into brett for me is number one the overall dollar strength and number two um you know with the yen which you know as viewed as a um as a carry currency there uh if we start seeing uh, the ECB pulling back, the BOE pulling back, Japan. There was uh, Ueda had as in comment. being done hiking when you say pulling back. Well, the, the, that they might, might well, not, maybe not done hiking, but certainly slowing down compared right. to the U.S. potentially. Uh, and then you got Japan with that yield co- curve control that's now uh, starting to get taken off the table there, which is um, tightening, though. Which is. It would be tightening if they did, but what I'm saying is if they're not looking to oh, oh, uh, increase see. the I yield see. curve control, I see. there's right. a lot of talk that they would take that that they would stop doing that, which would be a easing, obviously. Right. Or tightening, I should say, tightening. So the impact from the China disinflation on the dollar could be an interesting story there. Because part of the um equity strength i think has been with the dollar weakness so um, i guess my sure, thought yeah is, so you know if we start seeing the dollar rounding up how does that impact and commodities as well of course too right how does that kind of factor in so more from a dollar perspective on the china um weakness than anything else i guess right now well, one, one thing that i've noticed is that, so there's multiple factors in play here but the dollar tends to be So you can get to a point in a cycle, and we've seen this a few times, where you have sort of like a, um, like especially when the U.S. has been, let's say, first out of the box in a cycle, right? And you get this sort of period of dollar strength, and then the dollar starts to weaken. And a lot of times it's when the market is sort of starting to say, well, the strength that's been contained in the strongest areas is going to start to – it's kind of like breadth. In the stock market, where you go from, you know, the magnificent seven being the only thing that's you've got any money flows coming in to being, you know, suddenly we've got multiple sectors starting to rear up toward all time highs and, you know, things are kind of spreading out. Once the context is 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 better then you know, you get the sort of spreading of the wealth, so to speak, in terms of where you find the momentum and that happens in in the, the global FX markets too, to some extent, in my experience. So, you know, you get the you get the rest of world dynamic starting to play catch up, 
and a lot of times that plays into currencies as well. Um, so, so that's it's possible that that's going to be part of it. But yeah, I mean, the cycle has been, you know, sentiment turns first on, hey, the you know, the U.S. is coming out of the recession, or recession, the downturn. Alex, Alex, hold on, buddy. Um, and and you know, and then suddenly, so so like we we've beaten the the dragon of inflation first, and now maybe you start to see it kind of coming up in other areas too. So you get a little bit of that reverse of that, possibly like you're saying so it i mean it's going to be awfully interesting to see the the dollar is the most complicated market in the world it's also the center it's like the sun of the solar system everything revolves around it it's the ground for everything but there's so many different ways to participate in it and there's so many different influences on it in terms of cash um it's it's just it's really tough to simplify i think your analysis and i generally tend toward leaning toward technicals yeah okay all right, Brett. So that's going to bring us to the end here of our show. Um, Brett, with all that we've talked about, what's your basic takeaway from this sentiment and flow show? I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of in the mode of looking for some sort of consolidative process now that we've kind of, you know, put the dagger in the notion that we're still in a bear market. And sentiments kind of erupted around that. And we've got breath now and we're headed into the sort of parade of, of the, the, the mega caps. Um, you really starting next week, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And, you know, there, there's such a share of market cap. Um, you've got, you know, a week there where we're going to see if you take everything into account, 40 percent of the market cap of the S&P is going to come through in terms of earnings. And we've got enough late money r- rushing into this market that I suppose, you know, You've got a situation where hedging has gotten down a bit for the first time in a year, and probably some of that's going to come back on in front of that. Uh, but I think that people are going to look past things right now, unless they're really shocking. Um, I don't know how much this earnings season is going to matter that much in terms of what companies actually say. Well, of those big seven undershoot, given the value high valuations. Yeah, but then they're just like headed toward the AI revolution. You know, like I mean, where where like if they undershoot, they say it's because we're totally misjudged. Our whole business model is fine, but like I don't know how many people are going to get rid of those plays sure. on an off quarter right now. Would it spark rotation? I, well, so there's so little money in anything else. That, that's the main thing to start spark rotation. Is just people have been saying it's you know it's just going to be this small group and then you know people start to realize hey wait a minute you know the commodities are going to be a second half story like we talked about you know once you start to get people really dropping the recession idea in your term and you know they like we've just we've seen so many uh, uh, uh firms start to raise their oil targets over the last week like it's going from 65 to 75 to you know 82 to 95 like we've seen these zones move up in terms of wti there's lots of there's lots of messages like that coming i think and so yeah it's going to expand in terms of breadth it's going to expand in different areas of the market because these things have you know domino consequences and when you when you when you move into a different sort of phase of trend and people start to feel a little bit more comfortable and companies start to feel like their business plans are a little bit more predictable um, they're not going to just constantly see the price of money go up every time the Fed meets. And, you know, they're able to realize that inflation is not going to go to the moon and it's probably something that's relatively under control. They can start to invest more, right? Business investment goes up, um, you know, that spreads the, the money that they pay for plant and equipment and people and everything else spreads. And then the credit ratings of all those things go up and then those people start to spend more because they have access to more credit. And it's just a virtuous circle at that point. So this is the leaks out across the system and you start to get everything involved. And I think we kind of have started to trigger that, that sort of, you know, organic kind of process uh, on a base level. And I feel like that's, you know, it, it's tough in the midst of that sort of thing, starting to, starting to present itself to see, like we, I think we could have a consolidative range trade period, you know, then you start to look for the next leg rather than this has been a foolish bubble wave of a bear market and we're headed to 3000 next, you know, and the more there's still people who cling on to that vision and, you know, there's still the process of giving up that vision. All right. All right, Brett, that is going to do it for 
us here. Um, for anybody listening right now, I will be shutting down audio. We'll be getting back on in a little bit. Just watching us 4575 level, which we've been pretty much stuck to since we started talking, Brett. So um, watch that closely. But hey, Brett, always good getting this discussion with you in. Um, we'll be posting the replay in a, in shortly here. And uh, Brett, you take care. You get back to those triplets and uh, you work on that end of the spectrum. You got it, Kev. <laughs> All right. Yeah, take say care. bye, Alex. Say bye. Bye, bye Alex. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a good one. I'll and be he out. meant bye, by the way. He meant bye. <laughs> I'm BYE. <laughs> no, no, bye. Bye, everything. <laughs> bye, Mortimer. <laughs> uh, but okay, so we're going to shut down audio here. We'll be posting the replay shortly, and uh, we'll be back on in a little bit. All right, take care. Okay, take care.